Since I and most of my immediate family live and work within a 30 mile radius, my bag is set up to allow for fast movement in urban and suburban areas rather than long-term survival in the wilderness. So I prioritized criteria that would minimize my travel time by keeping the kit under 10% of my body weight, including suitable footwear, packing navigation aids for planning efficient routes, and keeping communications equipment to improve coordination with my family and therefore prevent unnecessary travel. I also emphasized equipment that would address my survival needs in a 12 to 24 hour time period. This includes safety from both environmental and human threats, as well as exposure. I packed it all in an Ogeo or Ogeo Metro bag. It was given to me, but I was pleased with the quality of the bag's construction and its modular design, so I selected it for this build. Let's start by looking at the large side pocket. First, we have my fire kit. It contains a standard Bic lighter, which I keep inside an Exotank lighter sleeve to keep it dry and to protect the button from depression so it won't drain the lighter's fuel. I also removed the safety mechanism for easier operation with a gloved hand. Next, we have a box of 25 UCO stormproof matches in a box that sports two strikers and contains a third inside. We have a tea light for starting fires with wet tinder, a ferro rod with a dedicated striker, and four tinder quick tabs. Next, we have my medical module. Along with the tourniquet that I keep in the front pocket, this is intended to do two things, treat life threats and preserve mobility. On top, I have two pairs of thick nitrile gloves, a pair of trauma shears so I can access injuries without moving the patient, a mylar blanket for the treatment of shock, two vented hyphen chest seals for the management of penetrating trauma in the chest or neck, a flat wrapped ace bandage for sprains, DIY pressure bandages, and so on, a little boo-boo kit with band-aids and butterfly bandages, a couple of three inch gauze rolls for general wound care, alcohol prep pads for site prep and for treating nausea, super glue in the unlikely event that I choose to close a significant wound in the field, moleskin pads for preventing blisters, and body powder to keep high friction areas dry and therefore keeping the skin strong. Last for this pocket, we have two chem lights or glow sticks. I always keep the wrapper so I can control the stick's output and even direct it as a low powered backup to a flashlight. In this small pocket, we have basics like hand sanitizer, SPF 30 sunscreen, and 98% DEET insect spray. We also have some bleach wipes to help contain the spread of disease in austere urban conditions. Finally, I have a low end headlamp with high and low settings, but sadly no red filter. I keep the batteries in place, but I insulate them from discharge with plastic tabs. In addition to three cliff bars, my last side pocket contains my water treatment kit. Although it can't address urban water hazards like heavy metals found in rivers or chemicals often found in water features, it can improve the quality of water from safer sources like rainwater runoff, water heaters, and toilet tanks. My go-to is the very compact and lightweight Sawyer Mini. I store it with its accessories, including a straw so I can use it like a life straw. I keep the syringe to clean the filter through back flushing but also because it's handy for irrigating wounds. I also keep this flexible container for collecting dirty water, although it has a reputation for weak seams. But since the threading is standardized, a replacement can be easily found in most urban areas. As a backup or supplement, depending on the water source, I keep a bottle of iodine tablets. I was tempted to save space by carrying chlorine tablets, but its four hour treatment time compared to iodine's 30 minute treatment time wasn't an acceptable trade off for me. I keep the glass bottle wrapped in a few empty tea bags to act as a backup pre-filter for the Sawyer, as well as to reduce noise. And lastly, I have a Silcock key for accessing clean water from commercial hose bibs. Although you can often access this water source with pliers, a Silcock key definitely makes this process faster. In the front pouch, I keep a cat tourniquet folded for one-handed deployment. I also keep two heavy mill trash bags as shelter backups. After cutting the trash bag open, rocks can be wrapped inside the corners of the bag and secured with small diameter cordage to form attachment points. Items like logs or rocks can also secure the edges of the bags if stakes or additional cordage is not available. The watertight bags can also serve as a ground cover and can be filled with leaves, softer foliage, newspapers, or cardboard to provide insulation against the ground. My main flashlight is an LED streamlight which I store with a plastic disc to prevent discharge from the two AAA batteries. Because I have one laying around, I also included one of the notoriously unreliable Night Eyes light sticks, along with a ink pen and a thick sharpie. In this pouch, I keep an extra bandana and a multi-tool, specifically a Leatherman charge. It has some nice features like a 730V steel blade, a saw blade, a serrated blade with a gut hook, a file with two different grains, needle nose and regular pliers with a wire crimper and wire cutter blades, a bottle and can opener, 
a set of large two-sided screw bits, a small bit driver for glasses repair, what I think of as a small pry tool, and a pair of scissors. Besides its weight, my only gripe with this is that the pliers are not spring-loaded and therefore cannot be easily used one-handed. All of these tools can be fixed in position with relatively robust locks, and the multi-tool itself can be secured with a deep pocket clip. In the small pouch I keep some lens wipes to avoid scratching the coating on my lenses, some chapstick for a million uses, and a pair of scissors to make improvised entry tool making a little easier and faster. In the event of individual or mass violence, I carry a Smith & Wesson shield with a Kydex inside the waistband holster with an additional 7 round magazine. For repairs, I carry four 8 inch cable ties, a roll of 1 inch electrical tape when I need a tape that can stretch, 15 feet of flat rolled 2 inch wide duct tape that has a ton of other uses like an improvised candle for starting fires with wet tinder. In this little case I have three safety pins and an upholstery needle that has been pre-threaded with a length of Kevlar cordage. The needle's large eye makes it easier to use an inner strand from paracord to make additional repairs that may not be pretty but will still help you get home. Lastly I include a pair of cheap prescription sunglasses as a backup if my glasses break. Ideally I would prefer to have backup glasses with no tint but these have an 80% tint, making them slightly more useful for lower light environments. In urban environments, ready-made shelters can range in scale from abandoned industrial facilities to a poorly secured tool shed. However, these shelters aren't exactly a holiday inn, so I carry some basic items to supplement them. They include a 50-foot length of paracord, a climbing rated carabiner, four 5-foot lengths of paracord tied into a loop with a fisherman's knot, and four plastic tent stakes. Typically I use this to create a ridge line by cinching one side using a bowline knot on one anchor and tightening the line using a trucker's hitch on the second anchor. These anchors can be structural beams, wooden studs, heavy equipment, or a million other things. My poncho can be draped over this ridge line and secured to the ground with guy lines and tent stakes to form a simple A-frame shelter. With the hood cinched and weighed down with a rock, it functions much like a tarp. Additional shelter configurations can be used depending on whether or not you need shelter from the sun and prefer a breeze or if you need protection from, say, the wind and rain. But of course, urban areas are full of buildings that may be unused during a disaster. These buildings may not only protect you from the elements, but may also have running water, working toilets, even electrical power. Of course, you need to weigh the benefits against the risks of violating the law or coming across a property owner with an itchy trigger finger but you definitely want to have the option to make entry in the quietest, least destructive way possible. So in addition to the cash and prepaid credit card that I keep in this pouch, I also carry a few PVC door shims for loading latches, a folded wire hanger for entering certain kinds of vehicles, and a wide variety of small tools that I keep in this blue pouch, including a folding lockpick set. This certainly isn't my preferred method for picking locks, especially with only one size of tension tool, but it consistently gets me through lower security doors and padlocks. I also carry a decoder for bypassing key vaults that are still used in commercial buildings like strip malls, buildings that are being renovated by multiple contractors, and are even used still by some realtors and landlords who haven't upgraded to Bluetooth-based units. Also included is a jiggler that I like, and an M1 bump key that fits many of the most popular master lock padlocks. I carry some shaved down toothpicks to disable the keyway of a lock to ensure that I have time to collect my things and leave before someone with a key could enter a space that I'm using. I have this 16 foot length of 16 millimeter film to gain access to internal spaces like individual offices or closets when the building itself is unlocked. This length of copper wire is useful for loading latches of outward opening doors when the latch is protected by a latch guard. And finally, I carry a Hospital portable lock to delay entry through a door on which a lock has not been installed. If these tools are lost, many of them can be improvised using items commonly found in the trash, as I discuss in my improvised tool video. In the last of the small pouches, I carry some glucose tablets for hypoglycemia, since I am a diabetic. In the main pouch, I keep protective items like gloves, a hat, a bandana, and an N95 respirator at the top. The bandana and N95 can be useful when evacuating from areas affected by volcanic activity, wildfires, although it obviously won't filter out gaseous pollutants like carbon monoxide or provide oxygen, or in the vicinity of a collapsed building, as we saw in the September 11th attacks. This is also where I keep my poncho, which of course can keep you dry in the event of rain and can help provide some protection against wind in colder environments. I also keep a paper map of my area, which I keep in a Ziploc bag and have coated in a silicone-based spray for some degree of water resistance. 
I store it with a small base plate compass which has a rotating bezel and scale measurements for 1 in 25,000 and 1 in 50,000 maps. Combined with the ranger beads that I keep on my shoulder strap, I can navigate by keeping a pace count. I move one lower bead for every 100 meters and one upper bead for every kilometer to track the distance that I've traveled. I also keep a route plan for movement between my and my loved one's homes and workplaces so that I can select routes that are best to use when there is flooding or civil unrest, for example. Here's where I'm gonna lose you guys. I ditched my single-walled steel bottle. In my opinion, a smart water bottle is plenty durable and it's a better use of space. It takes a lot of resources to boil water that are time-consuming to gather and prepare and can put you at risk by revealing your fixed position. So if my filter and iodine fail and I can't find potable water anywhere in an urban area, I'll just make do. That being said, if I need to quickly warm up or dry some critical clothing, I carry a two-hour can of Sterno for a low signature, fast source of heat. I also keep a hygiene kit with a bar of soap, a travel-sized toothbrush and tube of toothpaste, and 20 heavy-duty wet wipes for general hygiene or to use as toilet paper. In the event that cell networks are jammed, as most of us recall from the September 11th attacks, I carry a Balfin UV5R UHF VHF radio. A few of my family members have one, and all of them are programmed with the same simplex frequencies for short-range communication, repeater frequencies for long-range communication, FRS GMRS frequencies to talk to neighbors with cheap walkie-talkies, and local fire EMS as well as NOAA weather frequencies for information. I keep a high-capacity battery for the radio in a separate bag to prevent discharge. This battery has a port for a barrel plug, which allows me to charge the radio with an adapter and power pack that I also carry. I also keep an earpiece for quiet monitoring of radio traffic. I carry a charger that fits Apple devices as well as USB micro and USB-C compatible devices. This can be used with an AC wall plug or with a 25,000 milliamp hour power pack. I keep my clothing in a watertight, space-saving vacuum bag. After opening, this bag can be resealed and a decent amount of volume can be removed through manual pressure alone. However, for maximal space saving, the bag needs to be suctioned with a hand pump, which I don't carry with my kit. Although wearing cotton in cold weather can be a poor decision, I choose to pack cotton boxers and t-shirts for warm weather. And I pack enough to change moist garments when the temperatures drop enough to warrant it. The pants I carry are a pair of Nylon Wrangler Outdoors pants. I plan on replacing these with a pair that is more subdued in color and that can be converted into shorts. The fleece is a generic offering from Walmart, but it's 100% polyester, which continues to insulate after exposure to moisture. With my bag, I always keep a pair of Vibram hot weather combat boots with an extra pair of socks inside one boot and a rigger's belt in the other. These are stored alongside a lightweight rain jacket, which I would like to upgrade to a Gore-Tex jacket with vents. Finally, in the laptop sleeve, I keep a blaze orange rain cover for improved visibility when walking alongside roads or awaiting pickup. Obviously, this can be used for additional water resistance when visibility isn't a concern, but one of the trash bags can also be adapted to serve this purpose.